Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the next installment in meteorology for professional pilots. This segment is going to lead us into wind shear. And we need to ask ourselves, or we need to, I guess, raise the question, what is wind shear? Wind shear refers to uh, a variation of wind over either horizontal or vertical distances. Um, it's normally like, okay, we got this aircraft here. If he's flying into this set area where wind sh shear will occur at this horizontal surface, he's coming in, and right now he has a relative wind, of, you know, just that he's flying through. That's just him flying through the aircraft, uh, and not the aircraft. Flying through the wind, there's a certain amount of air molecules that's passing over the aircraft in the wing as he flies through. It's kind of synonymous with like sticking your hand out of the window and watching it bounce, but when he gets down here over the runway threshold he's gonna have some wind shear going on. So just to give you an idea if we look at it on a smaller scale wind shear is just basically two different, I guess, uh, sections or portions of wind, and this could be vertical, we could turn this sideways, and it could be, you know, we could be flying like from left to right here, and we could have a downdraft and an updraft, well, this would be the shear zone, and two winds are going in two opposite directions, and what happens is there's a disturbance or a mixture, and these little curls are just kind of like just the result of these two winds interacting with each other but as we looked at the um, the situation with our airplane approaching the airport um, this pilot should as he comes down here and this is called a microburst we'll get in the, into that in a minute this is why we don't like thunderstorms at airports because of the uh, possible down, uh, microbursts or downward bursts of air that could happen and um, they could they could be very dangerous. Um, there's just, you know, when, when there's a, I guess, a wind shear, when the alert system is triggered, there's a certain procedure you would use, but uh, as, you know, coming into that airport. So uh, that's wind shear. It just, like the slide says, it refers to the variation of wind over either horizontal or vertical distances. All right. And like about 30 knots, if you see your, uh, I don't know, if you see your airspeed indicator bouncing around 20, 30 knots, you know, and you're on final approach, that is really not a good thing. So as pilots, what we will probably do to counteract that is carry some extra airspeed. Uh, to compensate for the gusts that could, you know, go in the wrong direction, so to speak. Uh, wind shear can subject your aircraft to certain updrafts, downdrafts, or extreme horizontal wind components, causing loss of lift or violent change in vertical speeds or altitudes. This is very, very bad when we are landing an airplane. We do not want anything messing with us when we're on, when we're on final approach. So that's why a lot of times when thunderstorms are directly over an airport, uh, the tower will just be like, you know what, we're not closing the airport, but we're going to just hold back on, depart on, de on departures and arrivals until the storm passes. Um, okay. Now, wind shear can be associated with convective precipitation, a jet stream, or a frontal zone. Uh, for our purposes right now, where we are at this stage of the game, uh, we're going to keep it. We're going to keep it uh, more on the convective precipitation and the jet stream side of things. We'll talk about frontal zones later because we're going to go into fronts later, and I'll cover that at a later date. Now, the bad thing about the wind shear. In the air at 10, 20,000 feet, um, you're going to get turbulence, okay? Nobody likes turbulence, but at the same time, 
we can reduce our speed to a turbulence penetration speed and we could um, limit any type of structural damage uh, that could occur. But down on the ground is where it's very, very critical, uh, wind shear. Um, we don't like wind shear on the ground. Now, here you can see this microburst coming out of this, and this is the convective precipitation. This is a building cloud. Um, we'll just call it, let's just call it a towering cumulonimbus cloud. And we're going to talk about clouds at a later date as well. We're not at that point yet. But this is a cloud and when you see a towering cloud like that that's built like a tower you can bet there's going to be some updrafts that built that cloud first of all but if it is a thunderstorm then there's going to be updrafts and then there's going to be downdrafts and the downdrafts uh, can in the downdraft stages um, because it's a remember that convection this is convective precipitation remember back to our earth diagram where you have warmer air rising, becoming cool, and then descending. So it's a cycle, or what we would call a cyclical process. Think of a wheel, a bike wheel, just rolling like this, rolling like this, so something's going up, something's coming down. Well, this microburst is a function of the downdraft. And when it's pretty low to the ground, this burst comes down pretty low to the ground, and you're flying. We can look at this aircraft here. Now, he's on a glide path. This is an ILS glide path, and for just our aviation enthusiasts, this is called an instrument landing system. The system is guiding the plane down, so this airplane is on a predetermined path to the runway. But this pilot is flying in an area of thunderstorms and potential microbursts, so he doesn't know what, he or she does not know whether they're going to get hit with a microburst or not. So, the plane comes here, and all of a sudden, this, this, this side of the microburst, man, the plane's like climbing a little bit, um, just the, the speed's increased, and oh man, we're getting great performance. And this is the increased performance here. All right? But then, what happens as the aircraft approaches the, the, the like, the main, uh, I don't know, I like to think of this kind of like, you know how that we talked about jet streams and how, you know, on the outsides, it's not that bad, but when you get in the inner core of this stream of air, boom, it's really hitting you fast and hard. So, as a result, when this plane gets here and this downdraft, it gets pushed down. Now, we get decreased performance because now we're going to start getting a tailwind. Um we're going to be pushed down as well and what this pilot is trying to do now is recover he's trying to raise his nose, increase power but he's being blasted with this microburst and he's pushing him down, 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 down and he or she uh, could potentially be pushed into the ground thus crashing so not good All right. Uh, wind shear associated with uh, the jet stream we can hit what's called uh, clear air turbulence um, when we're at higher altitudes um, and uh, clear air turbulence it could be dangerous you know you let your passengers walk around the cabin and you know okay you can uh, you can uh, disengage your seat belts and you can go to the bathroom whatever blah 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 stretch your legs and stuff like that and then you get hit with one of these currents and all of a sudden the aircraft is vibrating violently and stuff like that and that's no good so, um, wind shear is definitely something that we need to be aware of. Um, and we talked about the wind shear being uh, associated with com uh, convective precipitation or thunderstorms. Uh, we talked about the microburst. That is this. This is the microburst, the downward burst of air out of this convective tower towering cumulonimbus cloud. So we got to talk about a microburst. A microburst, a microburst is a small downdraft that moves in a way opposite of a tornado. Microbursts are found in strong thunderstorms. Within a thunderstorm there are two types of microbursts. A wet microburst and a dry microburst. They go through three stages in their life cycle. Downburst, outburst, 
and cushion stages. Alright, so this would be the storm or the cloud, cumulonimbus cloud above the airport, and this downward blast of air. Now on this side, you can have increased performance, but this guy's got to land on the runway, and he's got a lot more runway to go. So, honestly, really, he would really prefer to be down on the ground, pretty much at the threshold. You would want to avoid the situation altogether, totally, but I'm just, you know, just brainstorming a little bit. Um, let's see here. Uh, so, like I said, up here, um, we would get turbulence, um, and, um, just to come back a slide, I went ahead of myself. Why is this important to pilots? And I kind of touched on it. All right, this is a wing, also known as a uh, airfoil. If you guys are not aerodynamically uh, trained or inclined, um, and a wing or airfoil is a device a device to produce lift. The wing supports the weight of the aircraft in flight. Now aerodynamically air flows over the top and the bottom of the wing and you get a pressure difference that causes lift. And we talk about that. The air, this is an air, uh, airfoil in the wind tunnel. This is a side view. If we looked at this, if we were out, a bird flying and we looked directly down the uh, spar of the wing or the span of the wing on sideways it would look like this. So this is a wing in a wind tunnel and there's a little smoke introduced so you could actually see how the air interacts around the airfoil so basically the air molecules split up here they meet at the back this airfoil is slightly curved at the top on the bottom it's kind of it's mostly flat due to this curvature we get a pressure difference we get negative pressure on the top and uh, I did a video on aerodynamics you can go into this further but negative pressure is caused on the top and um, let's see here just wanna, um, negative pressure is caused on the top and um, Newton's third law of motion for every force there's an equal opposite force so on the top we get negative pressure on the bottom we get pre uh, positive pressure and as a result what happens is we get lift okay and like I said, there are videos that I've done on this in the past, and um, uh, that's fine. So, for our purposes, all right, the wing will fly fine as long as you maintain a certain airspeed. Now, I know that this airspeed indicator says about 135, 135 knots. Um, for our purposes, just disregard that. I just wanted to put an airspeed indicator up there. Just think theoretically. If we operate the aircraft at a speed slower than 100 knots, or just think 100 miles an hour, because a lot of you guys don't understand what knots are. Um, so air has to be flying, moving over this wing at 100 knots or more in order for the wing to produce lift and keep it in the air. All right, and it has to be flowing in this direction from left to right. If it flows slower than 100 uh, knots, then um, what happens is, um, copy. all right, and we'll paste. What happens if we allow ourselves, just think of this, this, this arrow as a vector, right? If we fly slower than 100 knots, then what happens is the lift gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller till it's nothing and then we have no lift and the plane will fall out of the sky now I don't want to scare you guys because stall training is a part of all pilot training so as long as we are above a hundred knots we get the lift that we need in order to keep the plane flying alright so like I said the wind has to be or the relative wind has to be flowing in this direction I'm trying to line it up pretty nice so we have to have a hundred knots of wind in this direction well let's say if this plane was on this side then 
he may be seeing 100 knots when he comes in on this side. He'd see more than 100 knots, but when he gets on this side, then what happens is he's going to have a reverse component of wind. Like we said, the airflow can needs to be going 100 miles an hour in this direction, and if we introduce a microburst, a burst of air flowing in that direction, then as we encounter that microburst, uh, we may drop from 100 knots to maybe, let's just say 80 knots. All right. And what happens is that's not good, so our lift would be reduced. Um, that's pretty much about as plain as I can get with that. If you need further information or you didn't understand that, then that's fine. I will do a video, another video on that. So air molecules meet at the front and they meet at the back. So we will fly as we will fly. We'll, we will fly fine. I'm tongue tied. As long as we uh, are moving at 100 knots. So if we're up at altitude like this aircraft, we're fine. Um, microbursts or downward drafts or any kind of drafts are really not going to aerodynamically affect us uh, except for turbulence and things of that nature but we are very vulnerable when we are in the landing stage um, like this aircraft he's clean his landing gear is up his flaps are up if he if he or she is hit by turbulence they can reduce their throttles and reduce to a turbulence penetration speed but this aircraft is flying around at about what 240 Maybe 280 knots. Uh, I'm looking at this calibration. 40, hmm. We're somewhere in between 240 and 300 knots. That's a safe bet because I'm really not sure how this airspeed indicator is calibrated. And that's fine. It looks like it's doing something a little weird. Um, let's see. It, oh, it's going to bother me. 20 knot increments, I guess it is. 1, 120, 140, 160, 180, tick 200, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So it's about 250 knots. That was going to bother me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so, like I said, here at this stage of the game, we're landing. We're very vulnerable. We're at very slow speeds. Um, if we add power, it may take a couple seconds for our our engines to actually spool up and re react to our throttle so this is a very sensitive stage of flight taking off and landing uh, are, are very sensitive stages of the flight and we do not need to be encountering things like this again here is another example of a microburst and we see our runway there our pilot is on a glide path to touch down on the runway but in the meantime, or en route to the runway, he runs. He or she runs into a microburst. At this point, the plane starts getting all kinds of crazy lift, and oh man, the plane just performs well aerodynamically, aerodynamically. And then when it hits, um, and we can see the precipitation coming down and stuff like that. So theoretically, you could be in a microburst. In, in a cloud or in heavy precipitation, low visibility situation and not know it unless you scan your instruments and actually see the gust of air increase performance on this side the vertical speed indicator drops and then you're like wow we're losing altitude and then you're trying to recover and you can't because you're getting pummeled by this gust so microbursts are very 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 serious as you can see uh, if we get ourselves too slow and stall as a result of that rearward component, uh, let me just jump back. Because if the air is flowing in this direction at 100 knots, we're good. But then if we get on the wrong side of that microburst, and let's just say we're coming in at 140 knots, and then we get a 50 knot gust in the rearward direction, then our relative wind just got chopped down to 90. 140, 50 knot gusts in the opposite direction. Our air our airspeed drops to 90 knots. All right, so um, that is a situation that we definitely want to avoid. Uh, here's another one. 
And these type crashes with these microbursts normally happen, they generally don't happen at altitude. At altitude, you're fine, you got lots of airspeed, you get nowhere near your stall speed. But when we get ourselves in a landing situation, getting low, slow, uh, and really not producing great amounts of lift like we would be in takeoff and cruise, then we could possibly become subject to these type of situations. But have no fear, the low level windshield alert system is here. Bang! Welcome to the low level wind shear alert system. What this system basically does is it puts sensors all around the runway or the airport, right? And these sensors, they all feed into a central computer and I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself because you can read about this stuff on your own, but these sensors help detect hazardous wind shear. Here's an example. But it uses that's this tower thing and a system that you that you see is called an anemometer. Anemometer. Okay. <clears throat> They're placed at strategic locations like I just showed you around the airport to detect variances in wind readings. Alright. If a bunch of other uh, sensors that we placed around the field are saying one thing because these are all fed to a central computer but if all these guys are saying one thing and then these two guys and if, if the pilots are landing on runway 27 right if all these guys say okay the wind speed is out of the west which would be a 270 heading at 15 knots right and then all of a sudden these two sensors say no we got winds blasting us at 90 degrees coming out of the east at 20 knots then the central computer in the towers is notified hey these guys are not playing nice with these guys so there's a problem because these guys are getting a whole different set of winds than these guys are and you could be you need to use caution uh, basically you would come in with extra power you come in at a higher airspeed just in case a gust hits you um, and I would be remiss if I didn't say follow your pilot operating handbook I'm just saying in a plane that I know um, that I'm familiar with flying and you know you know so really the FAA can answer is follow your pilot operating handbook in handling an aircraft um, and that's what I should say as an instructor. Um, so, <laughs> next what I said. Um, so, in flight planning, um, there are other ways. You have the low level wind shear alert system that tells us, hey, wind shear is happening. So, that's one way of avoiding the bad situation that we saw in the previous slide. In flight planning, um, you can go on the computer, you can look up Doppler radar, and uh, you have LLWS and you have an area blocked out and uh, let's see here Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, I guess this will be Iowa and Nebraska here so in southeastern Nebraska and southwestern Iowa there's some low-level wind shear alert systems going on so as a pilot in flight planning you would you would go on your computer you would look at the weather yourself. I would look at the weather myself. All right, and I'm going to do a video on that. But I look at the weather myself because I know how to go into the national, uh, national weather service and the national oceanographic and Air atmospheric administration it's websites. I know how to pull reports. I know how to read the reports. That's something that you're going to have to be good at, or get a at least working knowledge of if you are going to be a professional pilot. Um, so, yeah, low level wind shear alert system and Doppler radar. Uh, I'm sorry, Doppler radar systems kind of give you a clearer, more detailed picture of the thunderstorms in the area, which about allows for better probability of predicting the presence of wind shear. So, if I'm out here in Jersey and I'm flying out here to Nebraska somewhere, uh, or Iowa, like Davenport, Iowa, or something like that. I need to, I would be aware that like, hey I need to be careful there's low level wind shear uh, going out on out in these areas okay so that's wind shear now we're going to talk about moisture even though we can't see it 
um, moisture is always in the air. It's always in the air. Even though we don't see it, it's there. All right. Um, hang on, I'm just uh, just looking at my talking points here to make sure that I don't miss anything. All right, so imagine if every day was like this, or every night was like this. You know, nice clear flying day. You could see everything. There's no low-level clouds near the mountain, so we could actually see the mountains and not run into them. And at night, we can just see the city lit up, and we can see the highways or the shorelines and stuff like that and everything. Flying would be so easy if everything was clear. But as you may or may not know, if you traveled a little bit, it's not always like that. Here you can see a runway, very low level fog day. Here we're actually flying in the cloud. We can't see anything and we're flying by instruments and here we're on top of the clouds and there is no visual reference to the ground at this point. It's pretty much he's on top of the ceiling. It's all nice and, and like down here at the bottom, it's real dark and gloomy like when you're on the ground. In the cloud it's dark and gloomy. When you get on top it's like uh, Disney World or something like this magical sky blue white puffy cloud situation going on so uh, so flying isn't always easy because um, the moisture the difference between this and this is just moisture in the air um, and so you say okay well there's moisture in this situation and there's moisture in this site situa situation. So what the heck happened? Water vapor happened. Water vapor happened. All right. Within our Earth's climactic, climactic range, uh, water could uh, or water vapor could be in three different states. Um, and normally, when we get water vapor or increased water vapor. Um, we get different types of weather phenomena uh, due to heat, some type of heat exchange. Um, so here we have, we can see a little steam fog. Here we can see the lady walking in the rain, and here we can see somebody actually in the snow shower. And I kind of highlight it. There's the rain, lady in the rain. Here's the uh, steamy fog situation, and that was supposed to be the lady in the snow. Alright, so um, here there's water vapor in this situation. There's water vapor in all these situations. There's water vapor in the air. Um, in this situation the water vapor is condensing. Alright, it's condensing. And here it's not so much condensed. It is condensed but it's in the form of these clouds that we can see. Alright, so, we can measure water vapor and express it in different ways. The two ways that we do do it is relative humidity and dew point. Here we got a lady at a weather station and uh, I, I don't know, maybe she's changing something or resetting something. Um, but the two ways we commonly um, express water vapor is in relative humidity uh, and dew point. And I jumped ahead of slide, relative humidity. When you see the weatherman talking, oh, the relative humidity is 25%, it's going to be not so muggy. If it's 50%, it's going to be very muggy. Um, let's see here. All right, now here, one thing we need to step back. Relative humidity is normally, is, is generally expressed in percentages. Relative humidity is the, the degree of water vapor or moisture that is in the air to it's to what could be in the air. So we got, say, uh, Peru. Yeah, I just looked like Indiana. I was looking at the cities. In Peru, we have 20% relative humidity. At Lafayette, we have 25% of relative humidity. So we got 25% of 100% that could be in the air and temperature kind of regulates that as well here are percentage scales if we're at 55% it's it's pleasant so in this situation here 
it's really not that hot, sticky type of relative humidity where there's so much water vapor where your clothes are sticking to you. This is at 20%. We're not even at 50. 50% 50 to 56 is comfortable. All right, 56 to 60% is comfortable. When it gets into 65, you get a little sticky. 66 to 70%, it gets uncomfortable. <laughs> and they got oppressive and miserable when you get into the 70s. So, when the relative humidity is high, we can expect, you know, a lot of water vapor in the air. All right. So, relative humidity routinely is expressed in percent. As the term suggests, relative humidity, relative. It relates to the actual water vapor present to that which could be present. So it's kind of like a woulda, coulda, shoulda thing. And I'm at 30 minutes. I'm going to stop right here because we're going to go. Um, no, you know what? I'm going to keep going because we got to talk about dew point. Uh, relative humidity. All right. So uh, it's temperature kind of dictates how much relative humidity could be in the air. Normally when we have high temperatures like 94 degrees here, there is a potential. The, the hotter the water is, the hotter the water, the hotter, the warmer the atmosphere is, the more relative humidity you can have. And we have a diagram here that's in the text. The blue dots illustrate increased water vapor capacity. When we have a low temperature, very, very cold, you see the two dots, that represents water vapor. When we bring it up to a medium temperature, um, let's see, uh, up, 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 let's see, 94, 2.75, relative humidity is, is, is high in that sense. So we get about 70, 80 degrees, we're like at medium. Um, we have more water vapor because the temperature increased. Then we go high, and then we have a lot of water vapor. This is like 100 plus. All right, so we need to understand that temperature, the warmer it gets, the more water vapor you have in the air. All right, so the caption, blue dots illustrate the increased water vapor capacity of warmer air. Um, and yeah, I should, the yeah, capacity, it's capable of holding more water vapor. At each temperature, air can hold a specific amount of water vapor no more. So here at the low, two dots represent a low relative humidity, low water capacity, medium, medium, and high temperature, high. Alright, um, here's the temperature. The temperature is 37 degrees. Alright, so relative humidity depends on both temperature and water vapor. Alright, so this is just showing you that the dew point, I'm sorry, the dew point is 37 degrees. We'll talk about dew point. The dew point is the temperature at which air has to be cooled in order to become totally saturated. That's when in the mornings you get wet grass and see wetness on the leaves and stuff like that. So that's dew point. We are going to go into it later. Um, here we have three different temperatures. We have 55 degrees, 44 degrees, and 37 degrees. Now, like I said, 37 degrees was the dew point. All right. So, and what did I just say? Dew point is the temperature at which air must be cooled in order to become totally saturated. All right. So, actual water vapor. All right. Da 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 da. da. 55 degrees. The temperature is 37. So we have 55, 37. It's almost 20 degrees, actually uh, up, 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 18 degrees, 10, 47, 8, yeah, so 18 degrees above dew point, so 55 degrees, the dew point is 37, 37. this is called a temperature dew point spread. Um, what is my point? The temperature dew point spread. The temperature is 55, the dew point is 37. The temperature dew point spread is 18 degrees. That is a decent spread, which means the temperature and the dew point are not are far from each other. As we get closer, 
I want you to notice something because this pie slice is the maximum possible water vapor that you could have, right? But when the temperature dew, dew point spread is 18 degrees, actual water vapor is about 50% in this atmosphere. In this situation, we have 44 degrees, 37, 7 degrees. Yeah, seven degrees. So the two, the temperature forty four dew point thirty seven is closing. Here we have fifty five thirty seven eighteen degree temperature dew an eighteen degree temperature dew point spread. Here, the temperature has dropped forty four degrees to thirty seven represents only a seven degree dew point. So, who look what happened? Actual wa water vapor. We got more water vapor because we cooled in this situation. Um, and then we come to 37 degrees. The temperatures actually drop to 37 degrees, and the air has become totally saturated. All right. Um, pop, 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 pop. All right. So relative humidity has just increased as we drop down. Now, water vapor and temperature kind of play either way. Um, we can get, as we get high temperatures, we can have a high relative humidity if the dew point is up high. All right, and I'm going to go into that because now I'm looking at it. How I went into um, our previous thing, water vapor capacity. I know it kind of sounds weird because on both sides of the temperature spectrum, we could have high water vapor capacity and I, I don't want to confuse you I realize that that could have been confusing because at this point I said okay we got low medium high temperature alright and the blue dots in, in, indicate increased water vapor capacity so temperature dictates a capacity alright I want to be clear about that alright just when we have high temperatures we have the capacity alright not that it's actually there, but we just have the capacity. It allows for, it makes room for increased water vapor capacity. All right? And how each temperature, air can hold a specific amount of water vapor, no more. All right? Here what I've demonstrated is how, um, more or less how clouds form, in a sense. Um, we're talking about relative humidity and we see our temperature dropping all right we see our dew point and we talked about our spread 55 to 37 degrees we have a temperature of 55 a dew point of 37 so the number of degrees between temperature and dew point 18 that's what we call a temperature dew point spread and here the relative humidity has increased to 50 percent here 44 degrees 7 30, 37 degrees 7 degree temperature dew point spread Right, um, and then when we come down, when our temperature drops down to 37, we have 100% relative humidity. All right, so our temperature, we were really talking about water vapor capacity, relative humidity. Just think of it as kind of like cloud formation, and we'll get into this better. So, in this figure, the water vapor is constant, but the temperature is what changed in this situation, and we can see how the relative humidity played into it. Uh, so the water vapor was constant, the temperature varies. All right, and then you can just go through these slides, I'll pause for a second, on your own, and it just basically talks about it. All right, so I like this little cartoon. We see the temperature drop from 53, 52 to 51 degrees. The dew point is 51 degrees. So the temperature, this is a two degree dew point spread. This is a one degree dew point spread because the temperature is 52 and the, and the dew point is one. So there's only one degree separating the temperature and the dew point. I want to hammer in that temperature dew point spread. And then this temperature dew point spread is zero. And these guys were always there, or the water vapor was always there. But when the temperature dropped to the dew point, then let's do it. <laughs> Wee! <laughs> so the dew formed on the leaf. All right. Um, bop, 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 bop. Here is a diagram where you will find um, 
a temperature dew point um, spread all the way here down to Florida. We got 77, 62. That represents a 10, 15 degree dew point spread. So you're probably not going to get a lot of condensation down there. Uh, as we get up here, I'm trying to find something close. 8, 7. You're getting far apart there. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. We got warm, moist, moist air in this region, and then it kind of gets colder. So, yeah, I can't. I, I really don't see anything in this diagram with a close temperature dew point spread. But um, here, these represents airports, all right. And then there are temperature dew point spread, and then there's a uh, modifier for uh, you got winds here, uh, wind flags here. So it's telling you the direction that the winds are coming from and you have the, your temperature dew point spread so you can look at them and when you see something forecast like okay they got a, a small temperature dew point spread you could bet that there's going to be some type of uh, there should be some type of like low level fog condensation going on all right where water vapor makes itself present um, because on a clear day the water vapor wasn't really making itself present on the foggy day the water the water vapor has condensed and it's given way to I don't like calling it bad weather but weather with obscuring phenomenon I'll talk like an aviation weather guy um like clouds and stuff like that it's not the clear day alright um just looking over my talking points for a second here Relative humidity, we talked about temperature dew point spread, we talked about that. Now we have to go into, let's see here, all right. This is just saying our, our, our never ending weather cycle involves continual reversible changes or change of state of water from one state to another. So we have to, we have to take a look at the change of state. We know that water could be ice. It could be water. It could be water vapor. And these are the different modes. Okay, let's say I have a block of ice. Right? It's a solid. I add heat to it. It melts. It becomes liquid. I continue to add heat to it. It steams and eventually turns into a gas or water vapor. So that's all this thing is demonstrating. It's showing you evaporation, co condensation, sublimation, freezing, and melting. They're all changes of state. Sometimes you go from a solid and go directly to a gas. You can bypass the liquid state. So you can have a frozen rock, a block of ice, and then it can just turn directly into a gas. Um, sometimes gas, water vapor is a gas, can just turn directly into a solid. So you could go through these, these are your changes of state. But I plugged in some examples, okay? I think we're all familiar with what evaporation is. The teapot is whistling. That means that the water's boiling, it's ready. And the water's actually heated and changing from liquid state to a gaseous state. Um, condensation. This water is very, very cold. The glass is very, very cold. But the air around is warmer. So the water vapor actually comes out and condenses on the glass. This is sublimation, the changing of ice directly to water vapor. Uh, this is probably a dry ice, and it's going right into a a um, gas state. Sometimes snow does this when it snows, and you have a snowbank, and it does not actually all melt and run down. Some of it actually goes right into turns right into water vapor. That is called sublimation. So. 
you can look at this slide on your own and change the state. One thing that happens in the changes of state is it's a transfer of heat. Does not necessarily mean that temperature changes. It's a transfer of heat. All right. Here you have red. So to transfer heat, there's heat added, and then in this situation, there's heat taken taken away. All right. So that's what the red and the blue represent. If we add like our teapot, you have ice. We just put it in a room where it's a higher temperature. The heat of that warm air in the environment is going to melt the ice, turn into a liquid. We put the liquid into a teapot and we fire it up. And then that teapot that was blowing turns into gas. So in this situation, we added heat in both cases. Uh, in this situation, the heat is going to be taken away. So there's a heat exchange. That is what we need to kind of focus on and any change of state involves a heat transaction with no change I'd say not necessarily a change in temperature all right the book says no change all right so you can read this slide on your own you can pause it um, but it goes into latent heat of vaporization all right and this goes back to the transfer of heat when you sweat your hypothalamus reads your body, or your brain kind of uses the, the hypothalamus regulates the heat. All right, your brain says, "Hey, the body's warming up." So beads of sweat, or the, the hypothalamus tells the body, "Hey, the brain says we're warming up. You need to start sweating." And wiping off your sweat is actually a bad thing. You hinder the cooling process you're actually supposed to let the beads of sweat stay on you and evaporate in order for the heat exchange for you to lose the proper heat. Um, your beads of sweat come to the surface of your skin and they're supposed to change from gas or liquid I'm sorry to gas alright so they're supposed to just release heat that sweat so um that's like a little uh, medical aspect. When water vapor condenses to a liquid, or water sublimates directly to ice, the, um, energy originally used in the evaporation reappears as heat and is released into the atmosphere. So that, that, that energy that was heat is released back into the atmosphere and it just gets cold. We could get condensation like this, where gas, uh, I'm sorry, water vapor condenses, condenses right? Or it, instead of going to water, it could, go def it could go directly to a frost, which is a solid. Um, and that all goes back to our changes of state. All right. So in this case, water vapor turned to water. In this case, water vapor turned to a solid. Uh, bop, 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 bop. I didn't want to stretch it out this far, but I did. So I may as well just go ahead and finish this segment. Then we'll jump into the next segment. All right, so melting and freezing involve the exchange of latent heat of fusion. All right, so don't get too tied up into this. Um, you could dig deeper into this. You could do some research on your own, but primarily what I want you to get is the heat exchange, and I want you to understand how having a certain temperature, a certain amount of water vapor can cause different conditions to happen. And I gave you examples there. Um, up, 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 up. All right. So, um, as air becomes saturated, water vapor begins to condense on the nearest surface available. The water vapor become, uh, begins to condense. The water vapor is in the air. The temperature comes down, right, to the dew point, and then dew point forms and it's pretty much the air around this glass that has come to its dew point not like air far far away from this so it's not like an atmospheric thing it's more of a localized thing in this case here I think that it's more of an atmospheric thing like the whole forest is pretty much wet you don't get just one leaf that's wet if uh, the air has been cooled to its dew point 
it's like everything. It's not just one leaf. It's every if you're walking through the brushes, your pants, your shirt will get wet. So, um, as air becomes saturated, water vapor begins to condense on the nearest surface available. What surfaces in the atmosphere? Uh, what surfaces are in the atmosphere on which water vapor may condense? And we got our old Commander Chief George Bush. I just put that there because he's a known figure and he looks confused. And the answer to that is condensation nuclei. So basically, um, we will stop there. At this point, we've run 50 minutes, and I will talk to you later. Bye bye.